Hello everyone and welcome to another One Piece chapter review. We start off with Luffy in the cover of Shonen Jump, as well as uh, Kinemon, Momonosuke, Komurasaki, and Orochi. The four of them painted in that traditional Japanese art style using wooden panels. I believe it's called ukiyo-e or something like that. Uh, but anyway, they, they look great. We go to the color spread, which is also a great one, primarily because of Robin, but also because it has a lot of Easter eggs. There's a number there. Uh, it's like 972, so I don't know if that's supposed to be like a hint of like a, a specific special chapter that we have to look forward to, 972, and I, and I can't for the life of me figure out what uh, what else uh, that box says, but um, I like how Luffy's wearing his Pirate King gear, something similar to what Roger would wear, you know, with his, with his coat and hat. Usopp's wearing a Vikings hat, which is a reference to Elbaf, because we know the giants dress like Vikings. There's going to be a lot of Norse mythology reference in Elbaf. Now Zoro, Usopp, and Nami all have maps, and I don't want to speculate too much on uh, what those maps are of, uh, because they can just be like throwaway maps that Oda came up with for the color spread. Uh, but I do find it interesting that the globe in the middle, uh, that's actually like, you know, that's the world of One Piece. That's, that's, you see the grand line and the red line. So that's actually the map of the world that One Piece is in. Now, if you look at the point where Robin is pointing to, you could pretty much make the argument that she could be pointing to uh, the West Blue, a specific point in the West Blue. And we know that Ohara, her hometown, you know, this this uh, this island of, uh, of archaeologists, we know that that was in the West Blue. So she may, in fact, be pointing or kind of showing Chopper where uh, where she's from. And then the knife. Uh, that you see that's close to Sanji is uh, pointing at some place in the North Blue, which is where Sanji is from. So it would make sense that, you know, those those places are kind of like designating each of the, the, the places of origin for these two characters. Now there's also been discussion about uh, why Oda decides not to include Jimbei on, on these color spreads. Uh, but what's interesting here is that we actually get a reference to Jimbei in this color spread because Zoro is wearing a shirt that says Sun Pirate. And obviously, you know, we know that Jimbei, that's that's the pirate group that he used to belong to. So I think that's a that's a reference, a shout out to Jimbei. We start off with Big Mom's group or Chopper's group on their way to Udon. And uh, there's mention of the Oshiruko, because that's what she wants to eat. And then later on, we find out that Queen is also a fan of it. So I was thinking like, is that setting up a confrontation between these two characters? Are we gonna get a, a chapter called The Battle for the Oshiruko or something like that. Queen Big Mom versus Queen of Funk. At one point, Big Mom mentions Mochi, and so I thought that she was gonna make this uh, subconscious reference to something about Katakuri. Like, you know, maybe something like, you know, wouldn't it be funny if I actually had a son that was made out of Mochi or something like that, just, you know, something that's lingering in her memory but she's not really clear on. I think that what's gonna happen is that after this little mini adventure, Big Mom and Chopper will be really good friends, like super tight. And so even after she recovers her memories, yeah, she's probably gonna end up fighting Luffy at some point, but I think she's probably gonna say something like, I promise that no matter what happens, I won't, I won't hurt Chopper because of our adventure in Wano. And then Luffy will uh, have his fight against her, defeat her, and then Chopper will be around to patch her up. You know, because Chopper's dream is to be able to cure any disease, any sickness, and so I think that, you know, ultimately that's, this is where it's gonna lead to, where Chopper finds a way of, of curing Big Mom's, uh, you know, hunger episodes where she loses control. And of course that also ties into Elbaf because she lost control there when she was a kid over the Semla, and that's why the giants have uh, resentment and a grudge against her. We go back to the prison in Udon, and I find it ridiculous how the scorpion guy, I think his name is Daifugu, has the audacity, has the gall to say that if Queen had let him into the match, like this would already be over. Like, did you miss the chapter where handcuffed Luffy beat you up. We get two major revelations in this chapter concerning armament hockey. And it's funny how Oda treats these things as if it weren't that big of a deal. Uh, or he just kind of mentions them in passing. He's like, yeah, you can you can do this with armament hockey or armament hockey can cause this to happen. And it's like, wait, what? Like, hold on. Like, this is the kind of thing that I want to know more about. Like, this is stuff that interests me the most. <laughs> Luffy says that he's trying to train himself to be able to use armament hockey the same way that Rayleigh did or showed him back when he first introduced the concept to us. Now, 
For many fans, I think that this was the this was like a forgotten concept of sorts. Right? Like to me, it just felt like yeah, this was a thing that was introduced, but it was there for exposition. But now this thing is coming back into the story. And what's crazy is that according to Luffy, this type of armament hockey that Rayleigh used is of a higher level. So it's a higher tier of armament hockey, which we knew kind of existed because we got introduced to a higher level of observation hockey via Katakuri's future site. And so that kind of opened the door for this discussion about a higher level of the three, three types of hockey. And so now we know that there is indeed a higher level of armament. We know that there's a higher level of observation and I'm pretty sure, there, I mean, at this point, it's pretty much also confirmed that there'll be a higher level of King's Hockey as well. So Hockey pretty much follows the same format as Devil Fruit Powers do, which is that there's a, there's a tier or a level above normal Devil Fruit Powers, which is Awakening. So it seems pretty likely that Luffy will be able to shoot these energy beams or energy blasts from his palms, from his arms, by the end of his training in Udon. And I think this is an aspect where Oda has to be very careful about how he, he decides to apply and use this advanced level of armament hockey. Because I do think the last thing people want to see in this show right now is, is Luffy being able to use a hockey Kame Ha! Like imagine an energy blast coming out of each of these arms. Like, wouldn't that be insane to you? Wouldn't that be crazy? Especially because, you know, Luffy has been established as a brawler. All right, he's a hand-to-hand -hand fighter. That's that's his style of fighting. He's hand-to-hand -hand close combat guy. So if he masters this technique, it, it opens up the door for him to be able to use uh, long range, long distance type of attacks, which I guess you could say like, you know, him uh, stretching is kind of like, you know, long range, but you know what I mean. Now the thing here is that introducing this concept at this point in the story, kind of makes things more confusing uh, when it comes to pre-time skip because pre-time skip there were actually characters uh, in addition to Rayleigh that were doing something similar like Sentomaru for example. Sentomaru had a similar pose, a similar type of uh, uh, energy push uh, technique thing that he used um, that at the time was invisible. We actually don't get to see like a blast to the degree that Rayleigh was able to produce but so so it opens up this kind of worms right? It gets you thinking like wait a minute was Sentomaru uh, a high level armament hockey user as well. Also one of the Boa sisters kind of did a similar thing back in uh, Amazon Lily. So does that mean that she was an armament hockey pro as well? Are the Yonko capable of using this type of technique? And if so, does that mean that Big Mom was holding back when she used her black hardening armament hockey to push Luffy out of gear fourth at the tea party? Now if we're discussing this honestly, uh, my suspicion, what I think happened is that well, first of all, we have a statement from Oda that came out a while back where he says that he, he wasn't really sure about how Luffy was going to be able to take on uh, or try to defeat Kaido. He wasn't sure how he was going to write it. He wasn't sure uh, how Luffy was going to be able to come close to defeating Kaido because, you know, Kaido is so powerful. So what I think happened is that he was, uh, he did some brainstorming and he thought to himself, he thought, wait a minute, what can I use that is already part of the series. What, what concept can I use that is already there that I can reincorporate into Luffy's arsenal, into, into Luffy's uh, you know, uh, power style or techniques or whatever, so that people don't say that this came out of nowhere. So that there's at least some background to this thing that I can introduce uh, for Luffy to use. And so what I think happened is like, wait a minute, I used, I had Rayleigh use a blast of armament hockey. I can use that same concept and apply it to Luffy and then have him, you know, be able to use that and have that be part of his arsenal. So that that way it doesn't seem like it just came out of nowhere. That's what I think happened. So if you take this armament hockey concept, plus you add in uh, the possibility of Luffy's awakening, plus you add in the Alliance, the group of people that also have a problem with Kaido and want him to, to be taken down, then uh, Kaido's defeat or Kaido being taken down by the end of the arc begins to, you know, look a little bit more 
feasible, a little bit more realistic and possible. Another thing that this reincorporation of, of this higher level of armament hockey does for the story is that it also explains a scene back at Marineford where Whitebeard uses his shockwave to destroy the platform. It's about to hit the platform. People are very happy. Like some people are saying like, oh yeah, like he's going to destroy the platform. Ace is going to be free. And all of a sudden the admirals block that blast and they're standing, you know, holding their hands up in that same pose. And there's absolutely no sign of them using their devil fruit power to do so. So this pretty much guarantees that the admirals are capable of using that same uh, higher level of armament hockey uh, push or wave or energy thing. Then we go to Ringo and we actually get a name for the Guardian of the Bridge, the character that is uh, supposed to be based on Benkei. In One Piece, his name is Gyukimaru, and uh, he talks a lot about Ryuma, and he actually makes a reference to him uh, defeating a dragon, which is actually a one-shot uh, a one-shot comic that Oda drew about Ryuma, where he defeats a dragon. The one-shot is called Monsters. Anyway, Yukimaru says that a long time ago, Wano used to be called the Country of Gold, and so that automatically got me thinking about whether or not there was a relationship between Wano and Shandora. Shandora obviously being uh, known as the City of Gold, and it was a part of Jaya, but was later knocked up towards Skypiea. Uh, and then, of course, we have that famous Goldie Roger uh, Poneglyph encryption written in gold as well so i just i just thought it was interesting that you know we've seen a golden city in the series and wano was called the golden country or the country of gold but the most important part about what gyukimaru says though in in this sequence is that shusui i mean he makes it seem as if shusui wasn't always a black blade that he it actually had to go through a process to become a black blade, which is a pretty big reveal because it sort of implies that the user of the sword or the swordsman can actually do something to make their sword become of a higher rank. Now here's the thing, we know that in the world of One Piece, the, the highest uh, rank or the highest grade of a sword is, uh, it belongs to a group of 12 called the 12 Saiho Uwasamono grade swords, okay? Mihawk, uh, the, his sword called Yoru, belongs to this group. Now, I always thought that these top 12 swords uh, were, were kind of like special items. You know, they were kind of like collectibles that were super rare, but that already existed, that came into existence as special swords. But given what Yukimaru says in this chapter, it makes it seem as if these swords weren't necessarily uh, created special. They were made special by their, their own particular individual swordsmen through the fighting experience that they were exposed to. It kind of makes it seem as if you can embed your own armament hockey gradually onto your sword and that's why it ends up becoming black. Unfortunately, two characters show up to interrupt this very important conversation and it's Toko and I believe the female is Komurasaki. There's no way Komurasaki is dead, so I, I think it's her. I remember Robin saying that uh, last time they saw Toko, I think they left her at the Pleasure District, at the Red Light District, so, and we know Komurasaki, like, like she used to work there, so it just makes sense that you know, she would be the one to, to take Toko in. Oh, Toko used to work as an assistant for Komurasaki as well. Plus, the woman is wounded, so I do think that's Komurasaki. Anyway, they're being chased, or hunted, rather, by Kamasu the Manslayer. We actually heard about him a little bit uh, during that section where there was, like, news spreading throughout the country, and there was, like, this pamphlet, and, you know, one of, one of the headlines said that, oh, like, this, this Manslayer guy hasn't been caught yet, so be careful, but it turns out that he hasn't been caught yet because he's been working with the Shogun all this time, so... He was never going to get caught. Um, and as it turns out, I think this pretty much also confirms that Nami's thunder attack on Orochi uh, obviously did not defeat him. And I, and I think that was kind of expected, but the fact that he sent out Kamazu to hunt down Toko and Komurasaki just makes it clear that Orochi is doing fine. Uh, anyway, the thing about this Kamazu guy is that he actually fits the silhouette of one of the samurai that uh, Kinemon was talking about recruiting. Kinemon says we need to recruit Shutenmaru, Kawamatsu, and Denjiro. One of the three, or rather one of the two, because we know what Shutenmaru looks like already. One of those two remaining uh, samurai has a ponytail. So I thought, I was under the assumption that that was the manslayer, but I think this chapter makes it obvious that it's not. So was that Kawamatsu's design? Is, is Kawamatsu the one with the ponytail? Or is there another ponytailed, uh, haired uh, swordsman or samurai in Wano that we don't know of yet? Because if so, that's probably Denjiro. 
Anyway, Zoro starts fighting Kamasu the Manslayer. And there's there's one panel in particular that was like, wait a minute, did he just like cut his head? There's a panel where you see a slash from Zoro, and then all you see is the, the ponytail of the Manslayer floating. So it's like, what happened there? So what I think happened is that he tucked in his head like a, like a turtle. Either that or he dodged it backwards, but it, it, it was very confusing. Then Zoro has to dodge Yukimaru's Bicento that comes at him from the back, and that dodge ends up causing him to get stabbed by the Manslayer Scythe. And at first, like, it seems like this was, like, unexpected, like, this was, like, totally shocking and he didn't want this to happen. But then by the final page, you have, like, this expression of, of pure, like, deranged madness from Zoro, I guess. And it kind of gets me to think that maybe he wanted to get stabbed because he wanted to have three weapons. So he takes the scythe that was used to wound him and he performs Rengoku Onigiri, which is the same attack that he used against Hiozo to defeat him in Fishman Island. Which is interesting because in this chapter, Zoro says that the Manslayer is strong, whereas when he fought Hiozo, he, he told them, you can't even kill my boredom. So it's the same technique that he uses on both of them, except Zoro doesn't have Shusui here. I kind of wish that we would have gotten a panel like this uh, for the Sanji versus Page One fight, you know, like Sanji landing like a final strike on him or something, but Oda decided to cut away from that for some reason. But anyway, Zoro's making friends because now uh, Komurasaki, or who I think is Komurasaki, will give him food and alcohol. Toko's there too, and I'm pretty sure of a, the bridge guardian, Yukimaru, will, will come around sooner or later. I think it's very clear that Oda likes Zoro more than Sanji. I mean, it, like even even Zoro's uh, fights in Wano or, you know, uh, the, the scenes of combat that he's had, Oda always gives him a handicap for some reason. And that only serves to make Zoro seem cooler. In the, in the first chapter of Wano, he has like a little seppuku blade and he cuts a building. Then when he's fighting uh, Hawkins, uh, he has to protect Tama. So, you know, that's a that's a handicap. And then in this in this chapter, he doesn't have all of his three swords. He has to make do with the, the scythe. And he also has to watch his back because of Gyukimaru. So it's like, man, like Oda really, really wants to make Zoro look cool. But when it comes to Sanji, well, we, we get a, a bathhouse scene with him on the floor and a puddle of blood. That's gonna do it for me. I thought the chapter was good. Uh, tell me what you thought about it down below in the comment section. Uh, talk to me about the points that I raised in this video. Subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I will catch you guys later. Take care. Bye.